Matthew chapter 3, we'll be looking at verses 7 through 12 this morning. A religious man stumbled across a baptismal service on a Sunday afternoon down by a river. He proceeded to walk into the water and stand next to the preacher, and the minister noticed the pious man and said, Mister, are you ready to find Jesus? The man looked at him and said, Yes, preacher, I I sure am. The minister dunked him under the water and then pulled him right back up. And he said, did you find Jesus? And the man says, no, I I didn't find Jesus. So the preacher grabbed him and dunked him again under the water, held him a little bit longer, and as he came up, he said, so did you find Jesus? The man looked at him again and says, no, I didn't find Jesus. And so he pushed him under the water and held him for 30 seconds this time, pulled him back up and says, well, did you find Jesus? He says, well, well, exactly, where did he fall? A religious, pious man obviously didn't get it. See, religion sees no need for Jesus. No need for Jesus at all. So today's theme is bad religion. Bad religion. Some of you that grew up in my day and age uh, know that that was a a band called Bad Religion, a rock band. I wasn't into rock music very much, but um, I know that there was a group called Bad Religion. A lot of my friends used to listen to them. But there is bad religion out there, and we're going to talk a little bit about bad religion and define that through the situation here with John the Baptist and with uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and this dialogue that they have one with another. And it's not very friendly. Uh, more, More on John's part, warning and encouraging them to have a proper relationship with Jesus Christ and not a religious relationship with him. And there is a big difference, and I hope to explain that as we go through clearly. We ended in verse 6, where many were being baptized by John in the Jordan, and they were confessing their their sins. And then we come to verse 7, which is our text this morning through 12. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water and repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse or clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Unquenchable fire. The Pharisees and the Sadducees belonged to a religious group. They were the religious system at the time. The New American Commentary on the Pharisees and Sadducees said this, The Pharisees and Sadducees represented two of the three main religious sects, along with the Assyrians, Assyrians. described in some detail by Josephus. You can find that in his book, JW282. Today, we probably would consider them a cross between the political parties and a religious fascist. Sadducees, we know little else but what Josephus tells us about them. Their name derived perhaps from David's priest, uh, Zodak, and they were political liberals with religious conservatives. A small aristocrat, and priestly sect that had made its peace with the Roman government. They believed only in the written scripture as divinely inspired and would believe no doctrine that could not be derived from the five books of Moses. So they were very very adamant about that. The only scriptures that were divine were the five books of Moses and they stuck to it very clearly. Hence they rejected angels, they rejected the resurrection of the dead, and so forth. And that's how I remember their name, because that's sad, you see, 
to reject angels and the resurrection. And then you have the Pharisees, uh, their name perhaps coming from the Hebrew uh, Pershim, meaning separatists. Uh, they were a large, more popular group of teachers of the law. They did believe in angels and the resurrection, by the way. And, and as you get into Paul's writings, he actually uses that against the, the two parties. Uh, he, he cites the resurrection, and then he cites the fact that the Sadducees did not believe it, and they start arguing with each other and taking the emphasis upon off of himself. They tend uh, towards political conservatism and religious liberalism. They have developed an oral law as a fence around the Torah, but the Torah was the five books of Moses. And so they developed a law around that to interpret that law so that there's more clarity in understanding what the law really meant. Because you, you hear something like, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. What does that mean? It's, it's very vague. Well, I think the Holy Spirit made it vague so that we can search the scriptures and find what it really means to love God. And there's, there's so many places that, that reveal that love of God from Genesis to Revelation, whether it's, it's clearly stated as a statement or whether it's through relationships uh, like Boaz and Ruth. I mean, that's a perfect example of loving God. Here's Boaz and, and here's Ruth, and Boaz just uh, gives everything up for Ruth um, <clears throat> as, as an example of what love is. And then you can go to Corinthians 13 and see the description of love. Love is uh, kind. You know, love is not rude, love is patient, those type of things. And so they, they in a sense, took the, the law and they tried to define it for us so that we could understand. And so when, when we come to thou shalt keep the Sabbath day, you know, what does that mean? And so they started making up laws and that were, was where we ran into struggles. Uh, you couldn't spit on the ground because you broke the Sabbath because as you spit, your spit hit the dirt and it rolled and created a furrow, which was work, and that was breaking the Sabbath. And so no spitting you know, was allowed. <clears throat> so a strict, not a strict, but a liberal interpretation of the Torah in trying to define it. Uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees apparently began to organize themselves at approximately the same time in the second century BC, uh, together they probably conspired no more than 5% of the populace. Here they are linked as representatives of the official leadership of Judaism. And so they're very well known. If you were to mention Pharisees, the people would know who you were talking about. They were the religious groups of that time, and they were looked up at upon. Uh, they were feared. They were reverenced. They were, um, they were everything you can think of just as we see today. And you think of the Pope and it's a big deal. You know, he's on TV and he's got crowds around him. You think of the president, the political leadership, and they have crowds around them and everyone knows who they are. And so this was the group at that time. And they're coming to John here and John's going to reprimand them uh, because of their religious uh, affiliation. So let's look at uh, verse 7 through 12 more closely. And, and I hope that you, you get this because my purpose is that you will have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and not a religious one. Even if you have professed Jesus Christ as your Savior or acknowledged that He was a religious man and a religious individual that came to the world to give moral values... Um, if you have at least that understanding, that is a type of religion. Uh, religion, basically, in, in my eyes as defined, is, is your way to God, what you think God would want you to do, and not God's way. Uh, you are making it up as you're going along, or you are justifying your actions and your deeds by your rules and not God's rules, and I believe that's what uh, religion is. And so we need to humble ourselves and say, to ourselves, forgive us, God, we want to follow you and have a relationship with you. And what's so interesting about that is that when I fail God, when I fail God in that relationship, if, if I don't measure up to maybe some of his commandments and standards, that's what's neat about a relationship. I can go to him and say, I'm sorry, I, you know, forgive me. I shouldn't have done that and I apologize and he just brings you right back in and says I love you and that's what a relationship does where, where religion will kill you <laughs> he'll just say sorry buddy you broke the log you go to jail you're condemned I don't want that for you have a personal relationship with him 
But don't uh, misuse that relationship either uh, as a license to sin and justify yourself saying, well, it's a relationship and not a religion and so I can go off and do what I want. I'll just come back. And That's an abusive relationship. We don't want to be in an abusive relationship. We want to have a healthy relationship. So verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So while John is baptizing the multitude of people, he, he sees the religious people coming to the baptism. Now, obviously, you can't miss them because they're dressed in a certain way. They have their, their, their attire, and it's very dressy, it's very colorful, and it's very noticeable. And they're coming to see, to search out, maybe inquisitive, to find out what's going on out here in the wilderness. Why are people out here? What new sect is coming up? And there were sects that were coming up all over the place. And so he, they, they wanted to know what was happening. And John sees them coming, and he basically, <laughs> to their faces, says, Brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Uh, he didn't pull any punches, did he? He pretty much just said it right out. Now, I don't think it was a, a condemnation. I think it was more of a warning. I don't think he was angry or upset at them. He was trying to get at their hearts. And it's hard to get at the heart of a religious person. It really is. They're probably one of the most hardest people to meet. Uh, and to get to know and to change because they're so set in their ways. Uh, they just believe what they believe and they're not going to turn from it. I remember years ago we had go- gone out witnessing and someone came up to the door and, and they shared with them Jesus Christ and the person just slammed the door on them and says, I'm a Baptist, and boom, just slammed the door on them because they're so set in their ways. Well, what does that have to do with anything? We're supposed to know Jesus. You know, it has nothing to do with our affiliation with the religious organization. So he didn't pull any punches. The Pharisees and Sadducees were always curious about um, any religion that would probably jeopardize their own. John saw not one, but many religious leaders come to his baptism as spectators. And so he created this dialogue with them. Uh, Who would warn you of the coming wrath? Uh, This is not a way to make friends or or, or, influence them. It's a way to make enemies. Uh, not very loving, some would possibly say, if you were in a crowd of people and, and shout out at them, you brood of vipers, you bunch of poisonous little rattlesnakes, is what he's saying there. He didn't beat around the bush straight and forward. Snakes are poisonous, and they kill. When I was in high school, <clears throat> I had uh, been already dating my girlfriend, Virginia, who's my wife today. And we had usually spent the afternoon with each other as long as we could. And so we would oftentimes walk from Roland High to my home, which is several miles, at least 45 minutes. And so we'd walk together to my house and then as much as time we could spend together there and then we would walk to her house which is another several miles up in the more richer classier area of, of Roland Heights there and then I'd drop her off and spend as much time as I could with her there well one day we were we were, we were walking from my home to her home and there was a snake and and you know being a young man you want to impress your girlfriend and so I thought well let me grab the snake I'll grab the snake and I'll show it to her, you know, grab it by the head. I've seen the, the, the shows. I've seen how they've done it. I've never done it, but I've seen how you step on their head and so forth. So I, I thought I'd do that. So I went and I, I think I found a stick and I put it on its head and its head was just kind of moving like this. And when I went to grab it, it grabbed me right there. And so there I was going, oh no. And I couldn't get the snake off of my hand. And so I didn't know what to do at that point. Um, didn't know if it was poisonous. Had no idea about snakes. You know, I just knew it was a snake. You know, so I decided, well, see you later. I'm going home. I got to go to my mom and find out what's going on here. And she went home. I went to my mom, went to the hospital, got a tetanus shot because I didn't know what was, was going to happen. Uh, snakes bite, you know, and so does religion. Uh, religion is, is poisonous and it'll, it'll bite and it will kill you. I'm sure that John was happy that they came, and I'm sure that um, he looked at it as an opportunity to share with them about the truth that was coming, that is Jesus Christ. And so he looked at it as an opportunity to share. So he shares with them in verse 8, Therefore, 
bear fruit worthy of repentance. Uh, here's John's message again of repentance. They were to turn from their religious works, is what he was saying, uh, of piousness, and they were to turn to God in grace and in mercy. Big difference. Big difference there. Works of the flesh to gain favor with God does not work. But grace and mercy before God is wonderful. It is beautiful. And it is the work of Christ alone instead of some religious obligation that presumes to give us access to God. Let's talk a little bit more about fruit worthy of repentance. And this is an important issue that John is bringing up here. Because it's not just repentance. It's not just saying, I'm sorry. There's an action that has to follow that. There has to be evidence that you're sorry. There has to be proof, uh, which is fruit, that you are very sorry for what you have done. So fruit of repentance. Um, We come to God, we ask for forgiveness. He forgives us, and then we repent from the things that we have done in the past, and we turn to something else something more productive, something more spiritual. That is what repentance means. And then having the fruit of that repentance means to turn from that sin and turn towards a purity in life. And John wants to see that fruit that they are not producing at that moment. They have a understanding of God. They have a set of rules to follow and they're following to the T. Paul, if you remember his writings, he said that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he followed them to a T. He, last week we were talking a little bit about education, uh, you know, and, and I wasn't against education to make that clear. I think once you become a Christian, you then get educated. I, I was a knucklehead. I was dumb. When I went to high school, I got Fs. Only A's I got was in P.E., you know, and, or cross country or track and those things. I just didn't care about education. I got saved and I read the first book that I've ever read in my whole life was the Bible from cover to cover. And I read that in six months. And so God began to educate me in the scriptures. I remember when I first hired on with Southern California Edison and I would kind of raise my hand and say a few things, you know, in meetings, you'd kind of, you know, ask questions and people look at you like, what, what, why are you talking? You can't even speak right, you know, just shut up. I could remember that. And then when I got saved, you know, years, tens of years later, uh, I'm in a meeting and I'm having this dialogue. And afterwards, uh, the guys are going, Ruben, you're different. Where'd you learn how to speak like that? Where'd you learn to use words? Where'd you learn to dialogue like this? And I just thought about him like, I didn't even notice it. But it was the Lord from reading his Bible back and forth. I mean, it's a great education. It has words that you've never used before, uh, uh, words that you'll mess up and then you'll come to know what it means and, and so forth. So it's a great education. And so I only contributed to Jesus Christ. You should have heard me, you know, 20 years ago. You probably really couldn't understand me. So God has done a great work. So I'm not against education. <clears throat> uh, they had all the education in the world. And Paul himself said it's all rubbish. It's, it's all like a pile of manure. What is more important is our relationship with Jesus Christ. That is relationship. In repentance, people can tell you that they're sorry because of what they've done. But there can be no change in that. If someone rips you off, let's say $1,000, And they come to you and say, oh, please, brother, forgive me. I'm really sorry. But then they don't return one cent of it. See, they're not really repenting. They're just sorry that they have to come to you and say, I'm sorry. Repentance means that that I'm going to show you that I'm sorry by replacing that thousand dollars that I've stole from you. That's what true repentance means. Bringing forth fruit that is in agreement with that or demonstrating that true repentance is exactly what the Lord wants to see in our lives. A changed life is what he's talking about here. If you're an alcoholic, you stop going to bars. 
I don't want to go to bars anymore. I don't want to drink anymore. And there's a, a, a working inside of your heart and in your life that the Spirit takes that says, I need to stop that now. If I have a problem with women, then I don't speak to women anymore. I don't speak to them in a seductive way. I don't search uh, out those type of relationships because I want to change and I want to uh, be a new person in that area of my life. If I have problems with Vegas, I don't go to Vegas anymore and I don't gamble anymore. I show forth the fruit of repentance that I want that changed life and that's a working that takes place in our hearts and in our lives it's an action that we have to actually exercise too many times we come up or we stand up and we raise our hand I want Jesus Christ into my life I want him to save me but then you stop there now the work starts now the attitude of God now you have to give me the power and the strength to get through this I'm going to trust in you that you have given me the power you have given me the ability to truly repent and to show forth that fruit of repentance he does through the power of the Holy Spirit he changes us and it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that he can do that in our lives and so as we confess and as we give it to the lord he then replaces it with what we should be doing and then he gives us the power to do that now it's it's a struggle as i said at first some things are easier than others i don't know why (laughs) there's some things i could just give up really fast and easy but then there are other things that just seem to hold on to me and i i hate those things i wish they weren't a part of me but i find that they're always on my back they're always holding on to me And that's where the frustration comes in. And and possibly even there's a point where we can get so frustrated that we want to just give up. But don't give up because God's grace is bigger than that. You see, God's grace can forgive even that. In fact, it has forgiven. When Jesus was on the cross and he said, it was forgiven, it was complete. He was talking about past, present, and future. And so the sins that you commit tomorrow are already forgiven, which is awesome. So I don't want to walk in those things because in my relationship with him, I don't want to offend him. I don't want to hurt him. And I know it hurts him when I'm walking in sin. And so I can come to him and say, forgive me again. Please help me in this. Please direct me. Help me not to get angry. Help me not to have bitterness. Help me not to continue on and blaspheming you in times and so forth. So so true repentance will be a manifestation by the complete ceasing from the sin Now, when I say that, I don't say that you will completely cease from sin because we are sinners, but we will do whatever it takes to renounce and to hate the sin that we're involved in. Verse 9, he goes on and says, Do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Now, this is the religious mindset, right? Well, our relationship is based upon our father Abraham. He was our father. He knew God, and we're his children, and he has promises, and we're going to fulfill those promises, and so we're Christians. We believe in the Messiah who's coming. We're saved. We're God's children, and and John is saying, no, you're not. Don't depend on your relationship with your forefathers. Don't depend on your parents. Don't depend on the church that you go to. Don't depend on anybody else for your salvation. You have to depend on your relationship with Jesus Christ. So you can't bring up your genealogy is what John was saying to these religious men. Don't think that God needs you in order to fulfill his promises. In fact, uh, he could raise up children from these stones if he really needed to. Back in Genesis... uh, chapter 12 God said to Abraham uh, to get out of the country go to a land and I'll show you show it to you and I'll make you a great nation and I'll bless you and make your name great and you shall be blessed and I will bless those who bless you but I will also curse those who curse you and so they were depending on that promise that God had given them and John was saying don't presume upon your ancestry and think that all the blessings of the coming kingdom must be yours because of that they needed to repent. They needed to turn to God. When you follow the story of the religious leaders, there were very few that repented. You have Paul, as I mentioned him several times, he was a Pharisee, he had repented, and boy, his life was changed. You have Nicodemus, who was also a part of the religious groups, his life had changed also. You don't, 
read of many more than that. Maybe a few others here and there, not by name and so forth, but very few. It's very difficult for them to change. I, I remember reading about, I have a book by Walter Martin, it's Kingdom of the Cult, and there's a group called the World Wide Church of God, and I read up on them. Uh, they, were <clears throat> they were teaching false doctrine. They didn't believe in the Trinity. They didn't believe that Jesus was God. Now, there were some false doctrine there, some heresies and so forth. And they've been around for a long time. And then it was uh, years ago that God just started to work in the leadership of that church. And it changed. They actually repented and changed their whole doctrine in another direction from that. And the church was just totally rebirth. It, not only did they um, change, but they changed their name. Now, can you imagine being the children of the parents uh, of this organization, how difficult that would have been? All their life they've been teaching this doctrine against the Trinity, that it was of the devil and, and so forth. You know, and now all of a sudden we were wrong and now we have repented. We've gotten back to the scriptures and what the scriptures are teaching. That'd be a difficult thing to do as hard as it is. But that's what repentance is. It's changing your mind and then showing the fruit going in another direction. And that's what the religious leaders needed to do. And John was trying to get at their hearts through these harsh words that seem harsh to us anyway. So he said, God will raise up children from Abraham and these stones if he can, as he continues. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So he gives this illustration of an axe that's ready to hit a tree and, and chop it right down and then taken and thrown right into the fire to be consumed by that fire. Now the Greek here for the root of the tree this verb is used as the perfect passive. So the idea really is the axe lies at the root of the tree. It's already there. Now, John is talking to the religious groups here. And as he's talking to religious groups, he's talking to Israel. And so he's talking to the children of Israel at this point. He, he's using Old Testament references here. Uh, three times he uses Old Testament references, which we'll see. And fire being the ultimate damnation of this judgment that is coming upon the children of Israel. And it's very near. It's close by. And it was, here's the Messiah coming, and he, the, here's Israel having an opportunity to repent and turn to the Messiah, but they won't. And so they'll be cut off at that point, which then brings about the gospel to the Gentiles. And that's where Paul comes in, where he began to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So John's not just referring only to a remote future, but to those who see that things are already happening at this moment, like John the Baptist here. This is uh, reinforced by the present tense of the three verbs here. I have fruit trees in, in, in my backyard, and if they don't produce fruit, I don't just leave them there. They're, they're not just ornaments, you know, say, hey, look at that wonderful fruit tree. Well, where's the fruit? Well, it's dead. It doesn't produce. I don't just leave them there. We had guys come by uh, yesterday and they trimmed all our palm trees and we asked them to pull, trim some of our fruit trees and we had one fruit tree that was dead and so they just took the chainsaw to the, to the root of the tree and whack, hacked it right off and threw it into the, the grinder and now it's little chips somewhere. You know, and that's what you do with things that are not fruitful. That makes sense? If you're in a religious system that is not fruitful, one day God is going to chop it off and throw it into the fire. So this is where we need to be careful. Even as Christians, I find myself at times depending on what I do when I come to the Lord, and I have to be careful that I don't do that. It's a struggle. I know that, that God's grace upon me is only his favor. It has nothing to do with what I do. But yet I find myself at times saying, Lord, haven't I been faithful for 20 years? It's like, yeah, you have. So what? <laughs> you know? Well, his blessings and his grace are not based upon my faithfulness for 20 years. But yet at the same time, we have to be faithful knowing that he blesses us because we are, off, we are faithful too. But we can't depend on our faithfulness to get those blessings. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. It, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a, 
a tricky thing and, and you have to kind of think about it for a while. And so we, we'll say things like, well, I've gone to church all my life, Lord. Why wouldn't you let me in? No, I've gone to church because I, I, I wanted to grow and I wanted to get to know you and I wanted to understand and fall in love with you more, Lord. And so you'll let me in because of your son, Jesus Christ. So again, that relationship. John said, cut the tree down because there's no fruit on it. Now we have to be careful here because sometimes we want to cut trees too quickly. What I usually do when I, I, I see a fruit tree that, that seems to be dying is I'll go up to the, the bark of it and I'll take my nail or, or piece of uh, metal and I'll scrape the bark. And if you scrape back the bark, you'll see that the, the inside is still green. So that means that it's still alive. And so you start cutting the dead branches and so forth and hopefully watering it and, and giving some vitamins and so it will bring back the tree. So you have to investigate and inspect it a little bit. And we have to be careful because sometimes as Christians we want to cut other Christians down really quick. Well, they're not fruitful enough, you know, and they're not doing what I think they should be doing and they should be doing this. And, and right away we get the ax and start hacking away. It's interesting, there's a law of warfare in Deuteronomy 2019 and it says when you lay siege to a city for a long time fighting against it to capture it do not destroy trees by putting an axe to them because you can eat their fruit do not cut them down are the trees of the fields of the fields people that you should besiege them then he goes on and says, however, you may cut down trees that you know are not fruitful trees and use them to build siege works until the city at war with you falls. And so there's a law there. Even when you go to war and you go into the city and you take the people and if they have fruit trees that are there, why would you destroy everything? Leave the fruit trees up. It'll give you fruit to eat. But yeah, if you go to war and even the fruit trees are dead, then chop it all down and, and re, you know, redistribute the whole land and do whatever it is you want. Make a tear over it. You know, they would do tears where they just throw dirt on top of one city, build another city on top of that city, and so forth. But don't cut it down. And what Matthew here is saying, the king is coming and the cutter down of every fruitless tree has arrived. And he's looking at the religious people. He's trying to get their attention. Now you might say, well, well, this is John saying this. What about Jesus? Well, Jesus said the same thing. Jesus taught a message of repentance. He talked about the vine and the branches in John 15. 1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And so Jesus taught the same thing, that if you're not fruitful, the Father will take you away also. Matthew seven sixteen. You well know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. As John the Baptist says, bring forth fruit. One way of knowing if someone is a believer or not is by the fruit that they have. One time Jesus was with his disciples. He was hungry, came by a fig tree, and there was no figs on the tree. And so he cursed the tree. When they came by the next time, the tree was dead. That's an illustration of Israel. Jesus was illustrating to the disciples, look, this is, this is the religious system of today. I'm coming as the Messiah. They're rejecting me. And so now I curse them. They will no longer have the opportunity like the Gentiles will to receive me. And so we are under the Gentile system at this point, the time of the Gentiles. The Jews have rejected Christ, put him on the cross, and he died and resurrected. They went out to the Jews and saved as many as could at that time, but then the gospel shifted towards the Gentiles, the non-Jewish nations. And so today we have Jewish nations and we have the Gentile nations. That's it. There are other no nationalities and so there's no Hispanic, there's no white and all that stuff. It's either you're Jew or you're not Jew, you're Gentile. And the gospel is going out to the Gentiles, that's us. And then during the tribulation period, God will then introduce the gospel back to them and they'll have an opportunity to, to uh, repent and turn to God at that time. And so Jesus cursed them at that point. And he even said, I have other sheep that you don't even know of. And that's speaking of the Gentiles there. So he's speaking to the nation Israel with the fig tree being cursed. 
He wanted the nation to turn to him. That was his heart, but they would not. And so John is, again, preparing the way. He, he's, he's, you know, kind of in a sense uh, taking the soil and turning it up. And they're getting the point. And they're going to continue to get the point as time goes on and until the day that Christ is on the cross. So the tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit is going to be cut down. And then he says in verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he, that is Jesus, who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And that's Jesus' baptism. The first baptism is John's, the water under repentance. That's John's baptism. We still do water baptism, but then there's another baptism, and that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Now John is speaking again to the religious leaders and saying, repent, you're coming, possibly even to be baptized, some of you. But this is just a water baptism to repentance. There's another baptism that's coming that I'm preparing for. And that's when Jesus comes. And we'll see it next week when Jesus does come and get baptized. That baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire and fire. Two different baptisms there. We still have two different baptisms today. You can get baptized in a pool or in a tank of some sort at the ocean, and that's a, water, a, a baptism of water, of repentance, but there's still a baptism of Christ, of the Holy Spirit in fire. That can happen at a water baptism. It can happen before a water baptism and after a water baptism. That's the baptism that we really want to see in our lives is the Holy Spirit and fire that he's talking about. Well, what is that? The Holy Spirit and fire. Well, the third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. He's the one that comes into our hearts when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. He's the one that comes into us and now we have God dwelling in us, giving us the power to live the Christian life. We can't do it without Him. Couldn't do it before without Him. Couldn't do it now without Him. And so we need Him in us. That's the baptism in the sense he, He baptizes and comes into us and empowers us with fire. Well, what does fire mean? Fire speaks of purity. It's, it's having a pure life. <clears throat> when you do some research, and I'm already running out of time, so I'm not going to be able to give you some of the scriptures that, that show that. Most commentaries believe it is speaking of fire, not judgment. There was a few that, that, that thought that meant that the Holy Spirit comes and then judgment comes. But I believe it's the Holy Spirit comes in you and then he gives you the strength to be pure because fire purifies it purifies. And John, in context, is talking to the religious leaders, show fruit worthy of repentance, so show me the purification process in your life. Don't, don't just say you come to believe in Christ, but then there's no purity in life. Your life hasn't changed. There's no fruit coming forth. So I believe that's what he's talking about. And so we need to ask for the Holy Spirit to come in us and then to give us the fire to live out that faith that we have in Christ Jesus. Isn't it interesting how you can see an individual, and I'm not pointing anyone out, <clears throat> though they're in every church, um, you can see an individual accept Christ, and it stops there. They're not gung-ho, you know, they're not excited, it's like, okay, this is great, I, I want to go to heaven, so I've accepted him into my heart, and, and they come to church once in a while, not all the time, they're not regular, they're not involved, um, they're not excited about what is going on. They, there's real no concern for anyone outside of their own little bubble. You know, and it's just interesting how that can happen. And that turns into religion. And then you see another individual and you kind of, those that are, are this way, look at them like they're a little crazy because something happens. They ask Christ into their heart and, and then they get excited and then they start looking and like, well, what can I do? How can I get involved? Uh, you know, I want to be at church all the time. I want to hear what he has to say. I want to read my Bible. I want to pray. I want, I want to grow. I want to learn. I want to change. You know, I'm so awful. I'm so bad and, and I need to change. And, and it's just not about me. It's about my family. They're lost too and they're going to hell and I want them to change too. You know, and I don't want to see them going to hell. I remember when I got saved, I was so excited about it. I called up my mom and I said, Mom, you need Jesus Christ right now. Because, you know, they tell you, you, you need to turn now. You never know what's going to happen. 
And she's on the phone like, okay. So I drove down there on a Saturday morning, 45 minutes from Redlands to her house, woke her up, says, you need Jesus. She goes, I have Jesus. Oh, no, you need to confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that he's the Lord and Savior. She got up and she's like, okay, I'll do that. You know, and she accepted the Lord on a Saturday morning in her bed. Of course, that was me trying to force it on her. But the Spirit just had a hold of me. But I think that was a seed. And to this day, she loves the Lord. She loves the Lord. She's always crying because her last, her, her son, my, my brother, hasn't accepted the Lord. And she weeps in her heart because she knows where he's going. That's a changed life. That's a relationship with Christ. You know, that's, that's the spirit and the fire that, that takes place in our lives. And John says, that's what you need, that baptism right there. Then he talks about the one that's coming that's mightier than him. And that's, of course, is Jesus Christ, whose sandals he's not even worthy you know, to untie. And John's talking again about his humility as an individual. Slaves would carry their master's sandals. They would be the ones to carry the burdens and so forth and do those menial works and, and, and stuff. And John's saying, I'm not even worthy to be your slave to carry his sandals. Uh, I'm so beyond that, you know, in the sense that I'm so bad and no good that who am I to carry the sandals of Jesus himself? There's another interpretation that I kind of like and I wanted to get into more detailed and I knew I wouldn't be able to so I'm just going to state it let you look at it and and, and think about it, especially with the Ruth experience coming up project and, and then being in Ruth right now but you think about Boaz and Ruth you have the kinsman redeemer law there uh, Ruth comes back home uh, her husband has died she has land she can't afford to keep it so there's a law and this law gave provision for families to stay within their families. So if you were part of the Levitical tribe, you could stay a part of the Levitical tribe. And you can redeem your land and you can redeem a wife. And so Boaz falls in love with Ruth, which is a type of Jesus and the church. And so he loves her so much. He does beautiful things like he tells his guys, hey, when you're picking up the grain, just leave a little bit for her specifically so she just can pick up a lot. You know, just things like that. He's in love does dumb things right guys do dumb things when they're in love and, and, and so so he does all of these things well he finds out that there's someone else that can redeem her so he's like going crazy if you can imagine a guy going crazy now okay how am i going to get this guy out of the picture what am i going to do and, and so he goes to the guy and he makes the story sound really bad oh boy you don't want this burden oh i can just imagine and he just makes it sound oh and then imagine what's going to happen to your household and your inheritance and now you have to share with her and so when comes time to redeem the guy says no i don't want her it's gonna be too much of a burden for me and so he you know he's just not gonna do it and they had a custom and they would remove their sandals from their shoes and saying i reject the position of a kinsman redeemer and I remove my sandals in a sense. John was saying, I'm not the kinsman redeemer. I'm not even worthy to pick up his sandals is what he was saying. There's a kinsman redeemer and that is Jesus Christ who has come to redeem the church from the grips of Satan. So he goes on and says, be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. But if you refuse, verse 12, the willing fan is in his hands and he will thoroughly cleanse out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire and that's speaking of separation from god gehenna eternal damnation and the picture is they would take the wheat and they would pile it up and they would have people in this case if you didn't have wind they would get people with fans and they start kind of just really blowing at the the wheat and the shaft and the lighter stuff would float away and you'd have the wheat left they would take the lighter stuff and it was useless it was no good and they would take it and throw it into the fire your religion is no good it's useless it's weightless it has no power whatsoever and if you depend upon that i'm sorry but it's going to be consumed by fire so religion kills it's bad to have religion but relationship with Jesus Christ is what saves. Let me close. Our acts of worship or even service will not repay God. It will not repay God. Those acts that we do are acts of love and adoration, adoration towards God. 
That's why we do it, because we love him. If you think that you can get in right standing with him or keep your standing with him, you're wrong. You're wrong. Your standing with him is based upon God's son's death on the cross and his blood that was shed for you. That's our standing. And there is no other standing that I want between me and God. It's him alone. So you need a relationship through Jesus Christ. And that only comes by giving your heart to him.